Well, good afternoon, each and every one. This is your brother in Christ, Tim Robinson, coming to you live here on Facebook and YouTube. I pray that God has been blessing each and every one that will hear me this morning. I give glory to God for you all and may blessings and hope of faith and, ev and everything that God has to offer be yours on this beautiful day that he has made. I honor my family, my wife, each and every one. Uh, we thank God for this opportunity to share from his words. I'm going to be speaking on a very beautiful subject this morning. A subject that can be kind of confusing because there's a lot of mixed understanding on this particular subject. A lot of confusion. That's why I'm going to be sharing what God has to share with me on this particular subject. The rich man and Lazarus in the light of scripture. There's a, it's, this is going to be a good one. I pray that you be blessed and God give you clear understanding of the truth that he meant for us to understand in this story. The rich man and Lazarus in the light of scripture. The reason why I say in the light of scripture because there's so much confusion about this story. And one of the reasons why, because most people believe that the story of the rich man and Lazarus is a story about a poor beggar by the name of Lazarus going to heaven and a rich man dying and going to hell. But is that what Jesus is want us to understand about the story? I'm going to show you in scripture that, that the answer to that question is no. That's not what Jesus wanted us to understand. I'm going to show you in the Bible that the story is about a unjust steward, because this is the subject of the entire chapter. The, unjust, the chapter of Luke 16 begins with the story about a, about a um, certain rich man had a steward. And in this chapter, Jesus is now pronouncing judgment upon the unjust stewards who were rich, who were covetous, who were full of pride, and they were described as the rich man. And Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the scribes in this story. They were the rich men who forgot the poor at their gates. They had no concern for the poor. Matter of fact, the scribes and the Pharisees hated the poor. The Pharisees and the scribes, they controlled the temple, temple worship in Jerusalem. And the poor was not welcome to the temple. They hated the poor. And these are the very people we're going to see in this story that God told them not to forget. Don't forget the poor at your gates. Uh, don't forget them. Uh, so, but they forgot the poor at their gates, and now judgment is upon them in this story called the rich man and Lazarus. Judgment is upon the Pharisees and the scribes, and Jesus came to give hope and life, to present to them the kingdom of God, those who were poor. Remember his words, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Why the poor? Because the poor needed a savior. The poor needed hope and he came to give them hope. Praise the Lord. That's what this story is about. It's not about a poor beggar going to heaven. As a matter of fact, heaven is not even mentioned in the story. But we're, uh, we've been told and taught that the story is about this poor beggar by the name of Lazarus going to heaven. They're considering uh, heaven to be Abraham's bosom. Remember the stories. I'm going to go over the story thoroughly so we can get a good understanding of it. But in the story, the poor beggar dies and, and as scripture says, he is caught up into Abraham's bosom. And people automatically assume that Abraham's bosom is heaven. But this, there's no scripture saying that the case in this story. What is Jesus trying to tell us in this story? The problem begins with most people is that they assume that the story is not a parable. 
And they want to tell you that the story of the rich man and Lazarus is not a parable because they want, want they want they have been led to believe that it's about a rich man dying and going to hell and a poor beggar going to heaven. And you have to make the story an actual event that happened. But Jesus told uh, many parables, which are stories. And uh, he begins not just this one, but many parables by saying, and there was a certain rich man. So there are several times that Jesus begin stories by saying, and there was a certain rich man. So why in this particular story of the rich man and Lazarus, we're going to assume that it's not an actual uh, story or parable. But they want to say that the story um, is not fiction. They want to say that, that Jesus was telling us about an actual event that happened. But it's a parable. I'm going to show you in the scripture that it is. We're going to see clearly that this story is a parable and it's not something that actually happened. Why do they assume that it's, a, uh, it's not a parable? Here's what they tell you. The poor beggar had a name, but the rich man didn't have a name. And that's the reason why they say it's not a parable, because the poor beggar had a name and the rich man didn't. But there's a reason why the, the rich man didn't have a name. The reason why he didn't have a name is because he was not welcome into the kingdom of God. As you know, the Bible tells us that when we are welcome into the kingdom of God, we have a name written in heaven. The rich man didn't have a name because he wasn't welcome into the kingdom of God. Lazarus was. That's what is meant by being caught up into Abraham's bosom. The bosom of Abraham represents uh, the poor beggar being welcomed into the kingdom that was promised to Abraham. Abraham, his name represents God. His name means father, which is provider. So Abraham is the one who is welcoming Lazarus into the kingdom. This is why Lazarus had a name and the rich man did not have one because he was not welcome into the kingdom of God. You see, people who are not saved People who um, are not welcome into the kingdom, they're, they're not given a new name. We who are welcome into the kingdom, we are given a new name. Amen. This is why Lazarus had a, had a name. And, and another reason, Lazarus was given a name because his name represented something very important in Scripture. That's when God gives a, a name, there's a good reason for it. We need to search the scripture to find out that reason. The name Lazarus means God is my hope. God is my help. God is my provider. That's what the name Lazarus means. God is my provider. See, and, and as you, as we go into the story, you're going to see that the rich man, his provider was wealth, money, materialism. The poor beggar had no provider on earth. This is why God was his provider, his help. And that's what the name Lazarus means. Okay, I'm going to show you, first of all, that the story here is a parable, not an actual event that happened. Okay? First of all, what is a parable? A parable is a story that Jesus told that people can relate to. Jesus told many parables in scripture and people can relate to these stories or these parables in the natural, but they did not understand the spiritual. Okay. The people didn't understand what the story meant uh, spiritually. When Jesus told parables, there's a mystery to be understood. A mystery is something that is, that is given in the world that, you just don't understand in the natural. When the, when the Bible uses the word mystery, it's talking about something that comes directly from God. And if you have not been born again of the spirit of God, you'll never be able to understand it. The mysteries of it. Okay. Let's go to some scripture. Matthew 13. You're going to be again in Matthew 13 to show you some interesting things about parables. Okay. 
A parable is a life story that Jesus told that people understood in the natural, but when it came to the spiritual, they couldn't perceive and understand what Jesus meant by telling the stories. And this is the case in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Matthew 13, beginning at verse number eight. This is the end of the parable that Jesus told concerning the sower. We remember the parable of the sower, which is a farmer. The word sower means farmer. See, people can relate to farming because that's all mostly what they did back in the days of Jesus. That's why he used this use uh, the farming in this story, uh, and uh, because people can relate to farming, they know what it means when a, when a farmer goes to sow his seed. Some fell by the wayside. They know the seed when it falls by the wayside, it's not going to take root and grow. They know that. They knew and understood that. They knew when. Uh, this seed fell on rocky, hard ground, stony ground. The seed was not going to take root and grow to be a fruitful plant. They knew and understood that. They knew and understood when seed fall among weeds or thorns, the thorns are going to choke the seed and, the, and they would not have a fruitful plant to come up and give them fruit to eat. They knew and understood that story. So here's what Jesus said. In verse number eight, when he was speaking to the people in this story, this parable, that they can understand, but spiritually they can perceive. All right, let's read verse number eight, Matthew 13, eight. But, um, but others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, and some a hundred, and some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. So they understood the story in the natural. But at the end of the story, look what Jesus said. Verse number nine, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, hearing is not only natural, but when you hear what the word of God is saying, there's a spiritual understanding. There's a mystery behind the stories that Jesus told. They heard the natural, but they didn't understand and hear the spiritual. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. Even the disciples at that time didn't. This is why he had to explain it to them again. Let's read on. Verse number 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speaketh thou unto them in parables? Why are you speaking to them in these stories that they can physically understand but not spiritually understand? Why are you telling them these stories? They asked Jesus this. Here's the answer. Verse number 11. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries. See, there's a mystery behind all the stories that Jesus told. There's a mystery behind everything that he said to John in the book of Revelation. When he uses terms like beast and, 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 uh, and animals, horns and, and, uh, 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 and mark of the beast. When he uses all these terms, there's a spiritual mystery behind them. There's a spiritual mystery behind the parables that Jesus told. And the first thing people want to tell you about the story of the rich man and Lazarus, they want to tell you it's not a parable. But I'm going to show you that it is in just a few minutes. All right, look, look at what Jesus says. Verse number 11. He answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries. See, the stories had a mystery behind them that the people didn't perceive and understand. But he told his disciples, it is meant for you to understand them. Why? Because they had been born again of the Spirit. They were going to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which would lead them and guide them into all truth, which would give them understanding of everything Jesus said. It was meant for them to understand. And today it is meant for you to understand if you have been born again of the Spirit of God. See, the reason why Nicodemus could not uh, uh, the reason why Jesus told Nicodemus, well, let me, let me go to the beginning. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said to Jesus, you must be a man that come from God because the things you're doing, no one can uh, see and understand them except God be with them. No one can do the things you do except God be with them. Okay. 
So Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again of the spirit, he can in no wise see or enter into the kingdom of God. You see, we who understand are the ones who enter into the kingdom of God. We're the ones that understand what Jesus meant in his stories. And the devil don't want you to understand the, the stories, the, the, the true mysteries of the, of the stories Jesus told. And, and, and the rich man in Lazarus is one of the most important stories in, in Scripture. All of them are important. But why don't the enemy want us to understand the truth about the story of the rich man in Lazarus? They want, they want to tell you, oh, this is an actual event that happened. That's what they try to tell you. And the reason why they try to tell you that because they want to support this hell fire burning. People have consciousness. These people are able to think. They're able to see and they're able to hear and speak while they're in hell. Hell is the grave. Simply the grave. But they want to complicate things so that you will now clearly understand that God meant what he said when he said, you will surely die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The word death means exactly what it says, the absence of life. But people want to use the story of the rich man and Lazarus to support human beings who are wicked in their life. And then they lay in that casket with no life, no breath, no consciousness, no eyesight, no hearing, no smelling, no tasting. Their, their life is gone when you see them laying in that box. But but. They, they want to use the story of the rich man in Lazarus to tell you that people go on and still live in a place called hell with, with burning fire and, and they have life in that fire. Fire consumes or it purifies. There's two things fire is going to do. It's going to purify or it's going to consume. You're telling me the wicked are purified? Because if, if they have immortality and they have life in the fire, then that means that they are immortal. And that's not what the Bible teaches. So let us, let us get a good, clear understanding of the rich man in Nazareth. Is this story an actual parable? Let me finish here in Matthew 13. He told his disciples in verse 11, you, It is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but unto them who don't understand and hear the mystery of the story, it's not meant for them to, for them to understand. Verse 12. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. So if you have an understanding of God, if you have the guidance of the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to continue to grow with understanding. That's what this text is saying here. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. So if you have the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you're going to know and understand. And he shall have more abundance. Look at that. When it comes to truth, we're not just going to have a little bit. We're going to have an abundance of truth if we desire it, if we live by the Spirit. But whosoever had not for him shall be taken away even that he had. When you don't have no guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life, the little understanding that you have of God is going to be taken away. This is why so many people read the scripture and they depend on man to give them the understanding because it's not meant for them to be led by the spirit for, for the spirit to give them clear understanding. See, it is the spirit that enlightens us with all truth, not men. I remember reading a text, I think it's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 21, I believe it is, where he said, you know, you don't need a man to teach you anything if you're led by the spirit. When you're led by the spirit, you don't need man to teach you, but the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And, and that's what the problem is with most believers who are stuck to this man-made institution called church. They depend on that man called the pastor to give them understanding of the word of God, and they don't depend on the spirit to lead them and guide them. And so that which you have can be taken away. The little understanding you had is going out the window. And, and, and this is clear in the word of God. God, uh, I think in uh, first Thessalon is it second Thessalonians? Uh, second Thessalonians chapter two. It tells us 
that God is the one that gave them a reprobate mind. God allowed them to have a reprobate mind. God is the one who is allowing them to believe lies rather than truth. Why? Because they have no desire to be saved. If, you don't have, if you're not sincere in your walk with God, you're not going to clearly understand truth. When you read the word of God, you're going to go to man to get the understanding of it. And it's not meant for us to do that. When we read the scripture, and if you have been born again of the spirit, God through his spirit is going to give you understanding. All right? That's just the way it is. God's going to be the one to give you understanding. We can't depend on man. To get, and that's the problem with institutions called church. The people depend on men. And because Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to come back. He's going to be the one to lead you and guide you into all truth. But now we set up in, 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 these, in these congregations called church that are really controlled by men. And we allow them to feed us what thus saith the Lord. And you're going to be led wrong every time. You see, when you identify a man as your leader, Jesus used the word leader one time. He said, blind leaders of the blind, they all fall into the ditch. And if you're sitting in a church this morning, depending on man, you are being led by a blind leader. Because the disciples was not leaders, they were servants. Jesus taught his followers to be servants, all of us. There's no leaders in the church. You don't even see the word leader used by the disciples. I have not read one verse of scripture in the new covenant where the disciples used the word leader. They never used, they never used the word. So you know they did not identify themselves as leader. Go in the Bible. Look up the word leader. The disciples never used the word. Never. Not one time. I used the King James Version. Find me where one verse where the disciples used the word leader. You won't find one. Why? Because Jesus taught them not to be leaders. When the, when the, when the question came up, and I think it's in Matthew 21, when Jesus was about to die, he said, who, who is going to be in charge? And, and Jesus said, it is the Gentiles, it is the people of the world who have authority and power over themselves. But let it not be so among you. He that is chief, he that is a leader among you, let him become your servant. This is why they never used the word leader. And again, I'm going to say it again one more time. The word leader is used in the New Testament one time, and Jesus is the one that used the word. And he said, you blind leaders of the blind. Nowhere else in the New Covenant was the word leader used. Okay? And this is the problem with us. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to get deep into this story of the rich man and Lazarus so you can see clearly what Jesus meant when he used the word the, uh, when he told the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay? Let, let's, um, let's go back into the scripture. I'm going to finish it up here. All right. In Matthew 13, verse number 12, number, uh, verse number 13, Therefore speak to I to them in parables. Here's why he spoke to the people in stories that they can understand, but not spiritually understand. Here's why he did it. Therefore, speak to I to them in parables, because they sing, see not. See, they understood the story, uh, the stories in the natural. And, so, and, that, and <laughs> this is so, so important, I'm going to say. It's so important that we do not try to interpret God's word from a natural perspective. God's word is spiritual. And we go to adding all this natural stuff into the, in, into the word of God. When you, when the, when the, every noun that you see in the, in the scripture is to be interpreted spiritually. And you, and you have to use your Bible to interpret what God is saying in his word. When Jesus said, build your house, I'm going to use this as an example. When Jesus said, build your house upon a rock, you need to go look up rock in the scripture. Not just try to, oh, uh, the rock is this or rock. No, go, go to what Peter said. The rock is Christ. So build your, build your house. What is your house? Your life on Christ. That's what it's saying. And, and, and everything in the Bible is to be interpreted this way. So when someone comes to you and says, oh, the mark of the beast is a chip. Where do you find that in the Bible? 
If it's not in the Bible, don't believe it. Go look up the word marked in scripture. Go start from the very beginning. I'm not showing you how to study the scripture. Go to the beginning when, when, when the word mark was first used. <laughs> That's how you interpret the Bible. And when was it first used? When Cain slew his brother Abel. The Bible says God put a mark upon Cain so he can be identified as a murderer. God put a, did you think, did he put a chip in him? No. So don't, don't, throw that stuff what man is telling you out. And go by what God is saying. Amen. Go by what God is saying in his word. So you want to interpret what Mark means. Uh, here's something else important. I, I, I know I'm straying off my subject a little bit, but I want to give you an understanding of how to study the scripture. Paul said, uh, here's something David and the apostle Paul said, Mark the perfect man. So is it talking about chipping? No. Identify the word Mark. When you read Revelation 13, talking about the mark, it's saying identified. The mark is an identification. He said, Mark Cain, identify him. And even today, we, we, we go by the same analogy. We do the same thing. If your police has a criminal that is, has not been caught and, 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 and detained, they mark him. In other words, you have pictures all over the place with Elvin, and they mark him. And so when you see him, you can identify. And the scripture, when it says mark of the beast, it's the beast who you are identified with. That's what it's talking about. But enough of that. Let's go back to the scripture, uh, the, the, the subject of the rich man in Lazarus. Verse 13, therefore speak to them in parables, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. The people, people are not understanding the parables. And the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, people don't understand it. The first they want to tell you, oh, this one is not a parable. Why? Because Lazarus had a name. Who told you that? Let's go to the scripture. Do you not know that the story of the rich man and Lazarus began by saying, and there was a certain rich man? That's how the story begins. That's not the only time Jesus used that term and there was a certain rich man. Let's go to some of the verses. He, he clearly said that it, uh, when he used that term, uh, it's a parable. Let's go to, um, let me, let's go with me to, sometimes it takes me a minute to get my scripture, but just, just bear with me. Because I want, uh, I want you to see something uh, about the story of the rich man. It is a parable. It's not an actual story of an event that happened. Okay. It's uh, as Jesus told was telling a story that people should be able to to relate to naturally, but understand spiritually. And that's what we try to do with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. We try to keep it in the natural. Oh, this rich man went to hell, and this poor man went to he went to heaven, and heaven is not even mentioned in the parable. They want to say Abraham's bosom is heaven, but the Bible doesn't tell you that. It doesn't tell you that. We got to go by what the Bible says, not how man interprets it. Okay, well, let's look at some scripture here. I want to show you that the story of the rich man is a parable. Let's go to Luke 12, 16. I know the story is in Luke, Luke 16, but let's go to Luke 12, verse 16. Luke 12, verse 16. All right. I'm going to start at verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. See, this is how man lived today. The more we have of, of the natural things that, that, that come to us in this life, the more we have that, we think the more we're blessed, don't we? Isn't that what churches are teaching? They think the bigger and more beautiful and more expensive their building is, the more blessed they are of God. But the Bible says God do not dwell in buildings. Hmm. I'm trying to give you something to think about here. Look at, look at, this, look at this story here. He said, beware of covetousness. Because covetousness is what causes you to live outside of the will of God. And there are plenty of scriptures that identify covetousness as idolatry. 
idolatry, serving a false god. When you are covetous, you're going to be servant to a god of this world. Jesus said you can't serve two masters, God and what? Mammon, which is money materialism. All right? Now look at verse I want, and here's the scripture I want, to, I want you to pay very close attention to. Luke 12, 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying. A parable is a story that the people can relate to in the natural, but don't understand in the spiritual. Mm. And he spake a certain parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man a certain rich man. Isn't that how he began the story of the rich man in Lazarus? And there was a certain rich man. So if it's a parable here, what makes you think it's not a parable in, in Luke 16? It is a parable. As a matter of fact, when you read the first verse of Luke 16, he said, and there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And we got to keep scripture in its context. Don't go out of context. The story of the rich man and Lazarus is not about a rich man going to hell and, and still being able to have con consciousness. <laughs> this stuff doesn't make sense what man is teaching us. Your common sense tell you that death means death because when you see people dying, you, I, we all have seen it. When you're lying in that casket, there's no life. There's no breath. There's no sight. There's no hearing. And then we want to say, oh, well, when they get past that, oh, they go into a burning place called hell and they're burning up. They're burning up. And <laughs> this stuff doesn't make sense. People are burning in hell, but they have life. They have immortality and life. They can see. They can hear. They can smell. They can touch. They can even talk to people in heaven. In the story, I'm just, when I show you the story, the rich man is talking to, to uh, Abraham. But I'm going to show you this death of the rich man is not the physical, it's not, it's not um, physical death, but spiritual death. I'm going to show you in the story. I'm going to give you clear understanding of this story. Just walk with me, with me through the scripture. In Luke 16, it begins by saying there was a certain rich man who had a steward. Keep the whole chapter in its context. Because when you get to verse 19, he's going to say it again. And that was a certain rich man. He said it again, twice in Luke 16. Let's go to Luke 16 and see it. In Luke 16, and he said unto them, verse 1, unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused of him that he had wasted his goods. Now, in this chapter, it begins by a certain rich man. Now, who is this rich man? The important thing to understand is who is the steward? And what did he do? The rich man allowed him to be uh, the manager of his goods. That's what happened in this story. But the steward was not a good manager. And we know the average rich man today do not give someone else all the authority and power over their wealth. It just don't happen among in, in today's world. But in this story, Jesus is talking about a certain rich man. I believe this rich man represents Christ himself. Why? Because it is Christ, it is God who gives us the power to be stewards. <laughs> It is God who gives us power to be stewards over his goods. What is his goods? His word. Amen? The goods of God. In other words, man's wealth is money, but the wealth of God is his word. Amen? Somebody might not believe me, so I'm going to go ahead and give you a scripture concerning steward. All right? I'm going to give you a good, under, I want you to get a good understanding of what, what it means by a steward. And let's, let's, let's go to some scripture. All right, let's go to some scripture. All right, look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Because the, the, uh, the 
Luke 16 began, and there was a certain rich man who had an, a steward, and the steward was not a good manager over the a rich man's wealth. First Corinthians 4 and 1. Let a man so account of us, of the ministers of Christ, as the ministers of Christ. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ. We are the ministers of Christ. Watch what else it said. And stewards of the mysteries of God. We are stewards. We are God's stewards. And see, and what, what happened here in the old covenant. Here's something. I, this is very interesting. I'm going to say in the old covenant of Moses. The people, the Pharisees and the scribes, they're the ones that controlled the temple worship. They're the ones that help control the power over the word of God in the temple. And they didn't allow the poor to come to the temple and come inside the temple. They were, did you, do you know the poor were not allowed in the temple? They were not. Only people of prestige, the elite, we call them today. In that day, people with money, they were, uh, and, and were allowed to, uh, to come into the temple. The poor were not allowed. And this is what G Jesus was addressing. And this rich man, this rich man represents the Pharisees and the scribes who were not good stewards. All right. They were not good stewards over their wealth and they were not good stewards over the word of God because they controlled the word of God in the temple. And Jesus was stripping them of their power as stewards. And that's what you see in the story. Jesus was stripping them of their power. They had the control over the temple worship, but now Jesus come and he said, All right, the temple worship is no longer going to be in these buildings. Now the true worshiper is going to worship how? In spirit and in truth. See, Jesus changed everything. Their power was, was, was going to be stripped from them. Why? Because they were not good stewards over the power of God. The word of God. This is what the story is about. And I don't want to go through this. I, I want to understand the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So as we go on, this is important here. As we go on through the story of the rich, first rich man, we down to verse 19, we come to a second rich man. But I'm going to lead up to that. Okay? Because in this story, the unjust stewards represented the Pharisees and the scribes. They were not good stewards over their wealth, and they were not good stewards over the word of God when they controlled the temple worship. They didn't want the poor to have no, no part of the word of God. This is why when Jesus came into the temple, in the end of his ministry, he overthrew their money tables. Isn't that the same thing we see going on in what we call church today? Their altars are used to make, raise money, not for the saving of souls. I used to be in a uh, mainstream church, but this was years ago in the 70s and the 80s. Back then, the altar was for the souls to come to be saved. Now the altar is just to raise money. You see how it done change? <laughs> they only raise money at the altar now. You come bring your money, you head back to your seat. They, they ain't concerned about your soul. And this is all in Matthew chapter 23. It's all, it's all over the Bible, but we're missing it. Why? Because we, we're depending on men rather than the Holy Spirit and its guidance. This, these stewards represents, this steward represents the Pharisees and the scribes. Because our, our, let's, go, let's go down to some verses here. Um, verse number nine. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. In other words, if you have money and wealth, use it to make friends. How do you do that? Helping those who need your help. Don't you know if you help the poor, you got a good friend for life? Come on. If you got more than what you need, but you 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 just use it to glorify yourself. Let me give you an example. A uh, 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 a person who has way more than what they need. They take their little 2020 Camry and trade it in. So I'm going to get me a Mercedes. See, they ain't thinking about helping nobody else. Your Camry is just fine for getting you around, right? But no, you got to glorify yourself. You got to look good when you drive. That's the only purpose of people wanting these nice things in life so they can glorify themselves. 
It's because when you stop at a light in the camera, you look over to see who's looking at you. You don't look over to see who's looking at you, do you? But when you ride in that beautiful Mercedes, that 450, whatever you want to call them, you look to see who's looking at you. And you and boy, you just eat it up and say, oh, man, I like your car. Don't we? Y'all know that's how we are. Nice stuff glorifies self. Nice stuff make you important. Nice stuff make you God. This is why the Bible teaches that covetousness is idolatry. It's the worship of another God. Let's look at this. Come on. Listen to me as I'm going. All right. And I say unto you, make unto yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fall, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. Every man is going to fall, right? I don't care how rich you get, how much you got, and you're all the power of wealth in the world can't keep you here when God is ready for you to leave. So when you fall, I mean, uh, uh, we can we can fall physically, but we can, uh, but the final fall is is when you land in that casket and all that money you left behind. But if you made friends with it, it's going to follow you into everlasting habitation. That's what that means. All the good deeds you've done, boy, when you get on the other side, it's all going to be remembered. And you might be able to help somebody who is who is who is uh, in the kingdom of God, and they, and 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 they're going to recognize you. Don't you know people recognize you for life when you do good toward them? Hmm? Oh, they, they recognize you uh, when you do bad toward them. But if, but we don't want that to follow us into everlasting habitation. We don't want that to follow us after death. The bad we have done, only the good. But if you use your extra wealth that God blesses you with to do good, it's going to follow you into everlasting habitation. Verse 10, he that is faithful and that which is least is faithful also much. He that is unjust and least is unjust and much. If you got a lot of money, if you're un, if you if you faithful with it, then when God bless you with with the riches of the kingdom, you're going to be faithful with it. But if you're not faithful, because He goes on to say, if you have not been faithful in that which is another man, how are you going to be faithful with that what God should give you to call your own? What God gives us is the, is the Holy Spirit. Are you going to be? That's why a lot of people don't have the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They're not going to be faithful with it. You got to be faithful with what God gives you. If you can't be faithful with money on earth, you can't be faithful with the treasures of God. This is what they're saying. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on because I want to get to the rich man in Nazareth. And you have uh, verse 13, Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. For, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God in the world. Mammon is all that stuff that y'all going to spend money on this, what we call Christmas. That's what mammon is. Money and materialism. All right? You can't be faithful with that, then you, you can't be faithful with the word of God. You can't be faithful with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you can't even receive it. For the love of money is the root of all evil for which some coveted after, and it causes them to turn from the faith and they enter into perdition. That's what love and money does. It causes you to turn from the faith and enter into what the Bible describes as perdition. What is perdition? Everlasting destruction, everlasting separation from God. That's what money will cause in your life. It causes you to turn from the faith and your faith is now in what the world offers. And it causes you to enter into perdition. You ever, you're lost for eternity. All right, let's continue to read. Verse 14, Luke 16, 14. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. This is very important. See, the, he said the Pharisees who were covetous it's a lot I can say about covetousness, but we, because if you go and look up that word covetousness in your Bible, you will find that it means idolatry, the worship of a false god. And that's what, and what, what they were covetous after, money and materialism, money and materialism. And they did what? Derided him. Derided Christ. That's what they did because they had money, fame and materialism. They derided him. What does derided him mean? They looked down upon him. 
thinking that they were better than him. Isn't that what's going on today with people who have lots of money? They think they're better than the ones that don't have it. Oh, y'all know I'm telling the truth. Thank you, Sister Sister Don. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your last name right. Bilal, for watching with me. People who are covetous, they think they're better than people who don't have. And this is what we're going to see in the story of the rich man in Nazareth. God is going to pronounce judgment upon the Pharisees and the scribes for mistreating the poor at their gates. All right, let's continue to look at this. And the Pharisees who were copiers heard all these things and they derided him. They picked on him. Oh, this man, he ain't nothing. He ain't nothing. And people do that today. They look, down, they look at the people who are uh, uh, dressed poorly, um, don't have money, don't have homes, don't have fancy cars. They look down on them as, oh, I'm better than him. They thought they were better than Jesus. That's what derided him means. They look down on him as if they were better than him. And they and they and they talked about him. They picked at him. Hmm. This is what they did to Jesus. Wow. And this is exactly what they were doing to the poor, which came, which came to worship at the temple, and they wouldn't allow, allow them in the temple. Isn't that something? The poor was not even allowed in the temple. Do your research. And the same thing goes on today. You come to a, a place called church today. And you got money, they're gonna treat you like treat you like you're the elite. You you're important. But you come down with raggedy clothes on and, and, and with no money to put in the pan, they don't even care if you never show up again. Come on. But the ones with money, they'll be calling them and say, Hey, when you coming back? <laughs> come on back to see us. They love and care about those who are are, are, who contribute to them continuing to be wealthy. But they look down on the poor. Churches are like that today. They don't care nothing about the poor. And the Pharisees and the scribes cared nothing about the poor. And this is what Jesus is addressing. They were unjust stewards. Hmm. God trusted them to have money. Don't the Bible say, and I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it is God who gives us what? All rich things to enjoy. Everything we have is a blessing from God. Your money. If God bless you with money, I don't care if you save or not. If God bless you with money, then, then you need to be a good steward of it. That, that's the bottom line right there. You got to be a good steward. And see, a lot of people don't understand what it means to be rich. You see, in the world, we have three classes of people, right? The rich or the wealthy, the middle class, and the poor. But in the Bible, there's no such thing as middle class. Ooh, you know why? Because rich in the Bible means having more than what you need in order to live. Hmm. If you got, see, poor means you can't afford to, to, to do anything for yourself. You need someone's help. But here are a lot of us calling ourselves rich class, calling ourselves middle class when we're actually rich. Rich is having more than what you need. You either have more than what you need in order to live or you don't have what you need in order to live. And if you have more, then you are considered rich, according to the Bible. Okay? All right, let, let, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. The, the disciples, I'm going to say the Pharisees and the scribes, they derided Jesus. They looked on Jesus, down on Jesus as, as if they were better than him. And people are just like that today toward the poor. They look down on the poor as if they are better, more important. Look at your television screen. You don't believe me? Look at your television. Everybody you see on your television, guess what? They're wealthy. You know why? Everybody on your television is wealthy. Why do people have millions and millions of dollars throwing footballs and just doing what we call acting? Don't you know to act means to lie? They entertain us 
with the stuff that that keeps us distracted from truth. This is why the devil rewards them with money. Because they do an excellent job. I just got to admit it. We're distracting people from truth. And that's the devil's job. The Bible says he's a liar and a murderer and the father of lies. There's no truth in him. So don't you know those who he reward with money are going to lie for him? People with money think they're better than you. That's why they think they can uh, get on what we call the news and tell you what to think, tell you what to believe, tell you how to dress. Uh, and the list goes on and on. They want to keep you distracted from God. And that's just the bottom line. All right. Uh, I want you to take a look at some more scripture here. Keep in mind. In Luke 16, Jesus is addressing the, the unjust stewards who are the Pharisees and the scribes. They were the unjust stewards. They had power over the word of God and they had power over wealth. And they were unjust with both. Look at this. All right, let's take a look at the scripture. All right, in Luke 16, verse 16. This is important as we go on. But the key verse I want to get to is 19, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the law and the prophets were unto John. No, no, uh, uh, I missed verse 15. I'm sorry. And he said unto them, when they derided him, he said unto them, ye are they which justify yourselves before men. And I just talked about that, how people justify themselves when they have a lot of money and uh, fortune and fame and they, and, they, and, and they have all this this attention coming to themselves. Oh, yes. Look at what verse 15. Uh, look at what the word is saying in verse number 14. On the 15, I'm sorry. And he said unto them, ye are they which justify yourself. Justify means make yourselves righteous. And that's what rich people do. They make themselves appear to be the righteous ones. And, 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 and those who call themselves Christians, they make it, they, make, they try to make everybody else look at their wealth is the blessings of God. But the true blessings of God is the guidance of the Holy Spirit and understanding his word. The true treasure of God is his word. Isn't that what King Solomon taught? The money is an earthly treasure, but the spiritual treasure is the word of God. That gives us wisdom and understanding of God. But here these people think, oh, I'm, I'm more righteous than everybody else who don't have money. Look at what the word is saying. Verse 4, 15. You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. God, these people who, who try to make themselves look righteous and, and, and make, make themselves appear to be the ones to tell everybody else what to believe and think. God know, really know your heart. Here you are standing in what you call the pulpit, which is nothing but a throne. <laughs> With all that power and influence of the people on the, in your king, little kingdom. See, what the pastor is doing is keep, the, he's not entering into the kingdom and he's keeping the people from entering in. That's why he don't teach the kingdom of God. He teach come to church because that's his little kingdom. Paul said, they're drawing disciples unto who? Themselves. And Peter said, they're making merchandise of the people. They, in other words, they're using the people for their own personal gain. In the average church, the people who are glorified are the leaders. That's who's glorified, not Christ. And I already told you and showed you, where in the Bible did the disciples, uh, Paul used the word leader. Show me one scripture where they even mentioned the word leader, where they call themselves leaders. It's not in the Bible. No verse where Peter called himself a leader. No verse where Peter even mentioned anything about leaders because the people of God are taught to be servants, not leaders. They are taught to be servants. Y'all remember the story when Jesus, when the people said, well, who are you going to leave in charge? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Who are you going to leave in charge? You're going to leave? Who's going to be in charge? 
And Jesus said, are you willing to drink of the cup that I drink of? Hmm? None of them were willing. And many Christians today are not willing to drink of the same cup that Jesus drank of. See, that cup was a cup of humility. But people want to be lifted up. I want to be a leader. <laughs> Jesus didn't even call himself a leader. He, he, oh, man, y'all got to hear me today. Uh, he called himself a servant. And here's what he told him. He said, the Gentiles, the people of the world, they have power over themselves. They, they look for power to be over them. This is why we have government officials and all these things, because the world have power over them. But he's but he told his disciples, let it not be so among you. He that is chief, chief means leader, right? He that is chief among you, let him become your servant. But the son of man didn't come to to, to, to be served, but he came to, 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 to uh, serve and give his life. That's why he said, are you willing to drink of my cup? Are you willing to give your life? Are you willing to sacrifice for others who need your help? No, you have to trade it. I said it. You have to trade in your, your 2020 camera to get you a Mercedes now so you can be more glorified in the world. So you can glorify me shine. So you can shine. You don't want, these people don't want Christ to shine. They want themselves to shine. And Jesus said, if you're going to be a follower of me, you must deny yourself in this world. All right, let's read, continue to read. Look at this here. I want y'all to see some of this in Luke 16. Look at what God is saying in verse number 15. Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. Talking about the, the, the unjust stewards, the Pharisees. And he's talking about the Pharisees and the scribes. And he's talking about us to, today who are just like the Pharisees and the scribes. They were people who looked down on the poor. They were people who didn't want the poor to have nothing to do with the temple worship. Oh, come on in if you got money. That's the way they are today. They don't actually say that in those words, but that's what they mean. All right. He said, but God knoweth your hearts, but that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What is highly esteemed among men? Money and materialism. And God is saying that is an abomination unto me. Why? Because money and materialism causes you to be covetous. And covetousness, he said, is idolatry. It's the worship of a false god. That's why Jesus said, you cannot serve God and then turn around and serve mammon. You got to love one and hate the other. Suspise one and cleave to the other. You can't drink from the cup of the Lord and then go say, I'm going to drink from the cup of devils. You can't do it. You can't eat from the table of God. In the table of God, the word is served. The truth is served. You can't eat from the truth and then say, I'm going to go eat from the cup of, uh, from the table of devils, which is nothing but lies and deception. How are you going to consume both and say, I'm a God? It just don't work, do it. All right. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination unto God. And now, verse 16. Now, notice what he says now. Luke 16 and 16. The law and the prophets were unto John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. What Jesus is saying here. From the law and the prophets on up until the time that John the Baptist came, came baptizing in the river of Jordan up until that time. Remember what John said? He said, the kingdom of God is here. He was John, that's what John, and then he was baptizing in the river of Jordan. He was letting us know that the kingdom had come. Jesus had come, who was the king. Christ had come to deliver us. And he was baptizing in the river of Jordan. Until the time that John came, now the kingdom of God is to be preached. Why? Because the kingdom of God is no longer a physical place. The temple of God is no longer a physical place. The true worshiper now worships where? In a place that can't be seen in the natural. Come on, y'all. But we flock to the buildings, don't we? I'm going to church. We need to... And we'll even say this. Oh, the church is the body of the people, but we still call the building the church. Why are we going to know the truth, but not follow it? How are you going to know the truth, but won't follow it? <laughs> All right. Well, look at the scripture. 
The kingdom of God is not to be preached. All right? And every man must press into it. You got to work out your own salvation. Why are you flocking to a man to teach you? When Jesus said, I'm going to pour out the word of scripture, Jesus said it. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Everybody can prophesy, speak the word of God. Everybody can hear from God. In Hebrews 9, he said, all shall know me from the least, no matter how important you are in life, to the greatest. Everybody have a chance to know him for themselves. All shall know him. Why? Because the spirit is in you now. Oh, Holy, Holy Ghost, thank you. With the spirit in you, that's how we know God. His spirit bears witness with our spirit, with this small letter spirit, capital letter spirit, right? His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. Not because we go to church. His spirit is the witness within us that we are children of God. All right? So we all have the opportunity to work out our own salvation. You are responsible are responsible, you're going to be held accountable to work out your own salvation. Stop depending on a man to work it out for you. Going to my pastor. My pastor said the word pastor, and I said it before, means shepherd. Hmm? David said the Lord is my pastor, my shepherd. <laughs> How many are you willing to make the Lord your pastor? He's the chief shepherd. He's the chief. And anybody else that identify them as themselves as pastors should point the people to the chief shepherd. I remember my pastor, Elder W.C. Smith, and he said this all. I've always heard him say this. Follow me as I follow Christ. Isn't that what he said, Brother David? Follow me as I follow Christ. My pastor always said that. That means a lot. But most pastors today, you better not follow them. Well, of course, where they're going, they're going up and up and up and up and up. That's why, uh, that, that, and, 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 and when I say up and up and up, they're, they, they're, they're making themselves God. They're wanting the people to look to them and glorify them. My pastor was saying, glorify me as I glorify Christ. Don't, but he didn't seek the glory. He pointed us to Christ to do the will of God. Let's continue to here. So when we look at this text in verse uh, 16, the law and the prophets were unto John, but since that time, but now we're to preach the kingdom of God. All right. And every man is responsible to press into it. I'm trying to press into the kingdom. Amen. And I'm, I'm trying to get you to seek the kingdom so you can do the same, press into it. But here's something else very important. In verse, uh, as we continue to read, verse 17, Luke 16, 7. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fall, to fail, I'm sorry. It is even easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. See, what happened here in this chapter, the Pharisees and the scribes, Jesus was uh, considering them to be unjust stewards. And the law that they called themselves keeping, the law that they called themselves keeping, they didn't keep the law. They did not. They turned from it for covetousness. Covetousness became their law. Money became their God. They didn't keep the law. And Jesus is telling them, judgment is coming to you because not one titter of the law is going to fail. All the law that y'all said y'all was keeping and did not keep it, that's not going to cause it to fail. You, what he's telling them, you're now going to be judged by the law. The same law that you, were, you, were, you call yourself keeping, but no, you turn from the law to be unjust stewards and to become covetous, lovers of money and pleasure. You turn from the law of God, but now not one titter of the law is going to fail because that same law that y'all call yourselves keeping, judgment is in that law. Come on, y'all. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? 
That, see, they didn't want to talk about the judgment that is in the law. People like to talk, oh, law, the law, the law, the law, the law, the law, the law. But they don't tell you about the judgment that is in it. I'll give you an example. People like to keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. But they don't want to tell you about the, the judgment that is in not keeping the Sabbath. Hmm? And see, it's, it's, uh, uh, we need to understand that if you call yourself keeping the law and you offend the law, then you are not truly a keeper of the law just because you say you love the law. There's so many people talking about the Sabbath and you know, they, but they offend the law in other areas of their life. Not one, don't you know you got, all the law is to be kept and you're going to be judged by the law if you don't. And that's what Jesus is saying. Not one tittle of the law is going to fail. The law that, the, uh, the good part of the law that you mentioned, the judgment in it is, 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 is uh, you're going to be judged by it. That's why he was telling them that at this time that they're going to be judged by the law. But because next, watch the next verse and you'll see what I'm saying is right. Look what he says after he says they, uh, the law is not going to fail. In other words, you are often to be judged by the law. But watch what he says next in verse 18. Whosoever put away his wife, mm, this is interesting, and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Here's something to understand about this. When I first read this, I thought Jesus was changing the subject from the unjust, about these Pharisees and scribes being unjust to it. But here's what God showed me in this verse. Whosoever put away his wife, they were supposed to be married to the law, right? Yeah, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were supposed to be married to the law, committed to the law. The law was supposed to be like a wife to them, but they put her away. Y'all hear me? They put her away. They put away the law. I just told you a few minutes ago, they became married to covetousness. They became adulterous. Are you seeing it now? The Pharisees and the scribes became adulterous. They didn't love the law. They put it away. And notice what he said. Whosoever put his heart away his wife and marrieth another committed to the they, were, they put away the law and got married to covetousness. <laughs> got married to money and materialism. That's who, that's who became their, their, their uh, uh, commitment to. That's why they're called adulterous. And whosoever married her that is put away from her husband committed adultery. So now, remember I shared with you earlier, since that time of the law and the prophets, the kingdom of John, uh, uh, when John came, the kingdom of God is to be preached. People are supposed to be committed to the kingdom of God now, not the old covenant law. They're to be committed to God. Because the same people that saying they keep the law are breakers of the law. All right? But look, because look at this. And if you marry her that had been put away, then you are an adulteress. Let me go to some uh, scripture here. Go with me to the book of Romans so we can get some clarity and clear understanding of what I'm saying here. Romans. All right? I think it's chapter 7. Romans 7. Verse one, God, I want you to get a good understanding of what, what, what is Jesus is saying about them putting away their wife. He's talking about them putting away the law. Look what Jesus, what, what, what Paul said in Romans seven, verse one. Know ye not brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Listen, listen. How that the law had dominion over a man as long as he, he lives. See, the law was supposed to have dominion over them. But they divorced the law and were committed to covetousness. Verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lived. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. You see, the law... In the old covenant, Jesus fulfilled it. Now we're to be married to the law of love. 
Because if you are married to the law of love, guess what? The law within the 10 are you going to keep because you love God. See, see, the law is all about love. And that's what uh, the New Testament teaches us. Because it tells us that love is the fulfillment of the law. In other words, when you love, you fulfill the Ten Commandment law. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Right? Thou shalt not worship any graven image. And, when, and, and it goes on, thou, thou shalt keep, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Thou, and all, all these laws, if you love God, you're going to keep them. And then it said, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not uh, bear false witness. All right? These laws, we're going to keep if we love our neighbor. All right. So anyway, they were married to the law. But now I want you to see also here in Luke 16. When we, uh, I want you to also see here in Luke 16 that the people were supposed to be married to the law and married to God. But they were not committed to the law. They were adulterous. The law was like a wife to them, but they committed adultery on their wife. Okay, so but now let's go to the next verse and get an understanding of what God has to say in the next verse. Verse 19. This is this is where I want I wanted to come to the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus did not change the subject to a rich man going to hell and a poor beggar going to heaven. The, the verse 19, it begins again with a certain rich man. The certain rich man represents the Pharisees and the scribes. Now judgment is upon them. And he's describing that judgment. Why? Because they would not uh, see after the poor at their gates. All right? Before, but before we read this verse, I want to I, um, I want I want to go to a scripture in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, I want to go to a scripture in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter twenty-four. All right, go to Deuteronomy chapter twenty-four. And I'm just going to read the scripture there because when we look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus, this is God pronouncing judgment upon the Pharisees and the scribes. Why? Because they were unjust stewards. They, they were stewards over the word of God and they were stewards over the worldly wealth and they were unjust with both. And here's what God told the people of God to do when it came to the poor. All right. I want you to see what God told them to do. OK, so. Deuteronomy 24. Verse number 24. Listen carefully. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 24, verse 14. All right. Thou shalt not oppress in hard servant. Hmm. Don't mistreat your servants, you bosses, you employers. He's telling them. Thou shalt not oppress in hard servant. God is telling them what they should not do. All right. Let me keep phone ringing to kind of distract me a little bit, but let's continue. Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy. Uh-oh. Are y'all hearing this? Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers. In other words, don't mistreat any poor, whether you know them or not, whether you're a kinsman or not. Don't mistreat the poor. He's telling them this. Or the strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. <laughs> Think about that. Don't mistreat the poor who is in thy land, who is in thy gates. All right? Listen to what the Bible is saying here. Don't you mistreat the poor. But what did they do? They did exactly what God told them not to do. Because the story of the rich man and Lazarus, look at how it begins. Verse number 19. Look at how the story begins, okay? 
There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple. Clothed in purple means they dress nice, they look nice, they, and in today's world, they drive fancy cars, they're on television. You see, they, they, they have the good life. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, dressing good. Y'all see how the preachers dress with their suit and then they put on their robe to make themselves look prestigious. They put on their robe to make themselves look more important than the people in the audience. See, see the people in the audience don't have a robe on. Right? Huh? They got a robe on. I wonder what they'll do if uh, everybody came to church one day and everybody had a robe on. He probably wouldn't like that <laughs> because that 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 robe, this this thing is, is him to be above the people, makes them to him to look more important than the people. So if they all had on one, then he probably wouldn't like that at all. <laughs> but anyway, look at what the hotter text began. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He lived good every day. Look at this rich man. And here's something we need to understand about this. He's describing most of us in America. Because don't most of us here in America, we live sumptuously every day? You don't suffer, but most of us don't suffer for nothing, do we? Hmm. Think about this now. But, but in the story, he's describing the Pharisees and the scribes. But I want you to, but I'm trying to get you to see there are many of us today who are just like the Pharisees and the scribes. We fare sumptuously every day. We look good every day. We sit back and we eat anything we want. We go to the finest of restaurants and, and we eat steak and lobster. We, we, we live good, don't we? And we, and we dress nice. This is what this is saying. That was a certain rich man. And he's trying to, he's trying to show you judgment upon the Pharisees and the scribes so you can avoid being like them. He's trying to show you, don't you be like the certain rich man. See, this is not about a rich man going to hell and a poor man going to heaven. Watch the story as it goes. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. I read in Deuteronomy 24. He told him, don't you forget the poor at your gates. The, the Pharisees and the scribes, they forgot to pour at their gates. Now judgment is upon them. This chap, this story is about judgment of being upon those who, who, uh, who, are, who are rich. And this poor beggar, he, and he desired to be fed with the crumb from the, which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his swords. All he wanted was crumbs. All he wanted was just enough to satisfy his appetite. But the rich man is living sumptuously. He's overfilling him, his stomach. He, he's overfilling himself with, with the pleasures of life in the world. Don't we? If you got a nice car, I say, I, I, I keep bringing this up, and it's a Toyota Camry, you're overfilling yourself. Well, I got to trade this one in and get me a, a Mercedes. In other words, you're living sumptuously. And you don't care nothing about the person you can help. That's what this is all about. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. This death here is not physical death. Because when you look at the death of the poor, uh, of the rich man, the Bible says, the, uh, uh, let's, let's look at what the scripture said. The beggar died and was carried into, in, by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Where is Abraham's bosom? Most of us conclude that it's heaven. But the Bible doesn't tell us where Abraham's bosom is, do it? What that simply means is that the beggar, he died spiritually. In other words, the flesh. Don't, don't Paul speaks about death of the old nature of sin? See, the beggar, the old nature of sin died, and, and, and Abraham embraced him with love and welcoming him into the kingdom. This is what we're seeing here. 
See, caught up into someone's bosom means giving them a hug, embracing them with love. And what Abraham was doing was welcoming Lazarus into the kingdom. Because if you think about it, the promise of God was given to who? Abraham. His name means provider. His name means father. And Lazarus' name means God is my provider. This is why Lazarus was given a name and, and the rich man was not given a name because the Lazarus was welcomed into the kingdom. And when you come into the kingdom, the Bible describes in, in the book of Revelation that God gives you a new name. So I don't know what my new name may be, but I know the Bible says that we have a name written in where? Heaven. And this, this is why Lazarus was given a name and the rich man was not. Why? Because the rich man, he was not welcomed into the kingdom of God. He's about to be judged. And this is not physical death. This is not a physical death. This is spiritual death. Because here's why, how we know it's not uh, uh, physical death. The Bible says that the rich man died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being tormented, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So the rich man was still able to see, right? He was still able to speak. So this is not physical death. Because we know when we see somebody die physically, there is no ability to see, speak, no breath of life. You look at that body laying in that casket, the breath of life is gone. Speech is gone. Sight is gone. Everything that pertains to consciousness is gone. All right? Only those in Christ receive eternal life, not the, not, not the wicked. All right. Let me so let me let me. Here's how you can know that he's not talking about physical death. Turn over to chapter 15 for a minute. There's another story that was told, and this story is about a prodigal son. We're familiar with that story. If you go to chapter 15 of Luke, there's another story about a prodigal, prodigal son. Now, in the story of the prodigal son, the son left with all the blessings of the father, and he wasted his goods, right? Y'all remember the story. I'm not, so I'm not going to go through the whole story and read all these verses. But we know the story, but I'm going to go to verse number 24. The son, he wasted his goods, and he was eating with the swine. And the Bible says he came to himself, and he decided, I will go back to my father's house. Uh, I will go back to my father's house. And be I'd rather be a servant there than to, than to be... Uh, Wasting my life with, with, with swine. So he, he came to his father's house and they saw him afar off. And his father saw him afar off. And here's the words of his father in verse 24. Watch what the father says when he sees his son coming back. Verse number 24, Luke 15, 24. But this my son was dead and is what? Alive again. Was his son really dead physically? No. He was dead Spirited. Spiritual death is separation from God and living outside of the will of God. And that's what we see in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Spiritual death, not physical death. It is not because it's impossible for this verse to be talking about physical death because people don't look up toward heaven and talk to Abraham when they're dead. Jesus is telling a parable. He's illustrating a story to illustrate a spiritual lesson for us to learn from. This spiritual lesson is about judgment upon us, like it was upon the Pharisees and scribes who were unjust stewards. They forgot to pour at their gates. And Brother David knew what I'm talking about because he, I see him always helping the poor, looking out for the poor. These are the things that illustrates true spirituality, true love for thy neighbor. Most people say they love their neighbor and they'll walk right by him. Y'all remember that story too, don't you? Priest came by, religious man came by and they all looked and kept going. When they saw this man laying down there needing help. When we see someone that need our help, 
and we're able to help them and don't help them, something is wrong with that picture. Okay? If we see somebody that needs help, we should help them. And that's what we're seeing in this story of the rich man and Nazareth. There is, there, there is no physical place called Abraham's bosom. This is a, a, a parable. If you go back to the beginning of my lesson here, I talked about what a parable is, a story that Jesus is telling to illustrate a mysterious spiritual message. Okay? So the rich man died. The first the beggar died. He was caught up into Abraham's bosom. He was welcomed to the kingdom of God. Now, the, it has flipped. Now, the rich man wants a drop of water to cool his tongue. Water represents the spirit of God. People who are wicked, they are not going to have a drop of the spirit of God. None of the spirit of God is going to lead them and guide them. See, Lazarus has the spirit of God now, and that's what people in the world want. But they, it's, not, it's not meant for them to have it. The life that is in Christ, the rich man couldn't have it now. He couldn't have the true life that God had to offer to Lazarus. See, the word Lazarus means God is my help. God is my provider. And that's who should be our provider today. God, not man. Now the rich man, send, send, um, if you can't send Lazarus with a drop of water, see, to touch my tongue. See, Jesus is illustrating a, a story that once you get out of his will and enter into that state of perdition, there's no coming back to God. Do you not know that you can reach a point to where you can't get back to God? Now, I don't know when that point is. But my, my, my point of telling us this is so that we will know that we can reach that point where we will never return to God. It's called perdition. And I can't say when a man or woman has reached that point. That's not, I'm not in a position to do that. No one is in a position to do that. Only God knows when you have reached that point. But I tell you what, we all better try to do our best to avoid it. And that's what this story is all about. Because now this rich man, he is separated from God and can't get to God now. Why? Because he loved materialism and mammon. That's what this whole chapter was all about. The love of covetousness and mammon. Now, send someone to my brethren that they may hear. They have the prophets, don't they? They have the prophets. If they don't hear the prophets, then send someone that is risen from the dead, he told them, to my brethren. If one came from the dead, they still will not believe. And isn't that what's happening today? We have Jesus Christ who have rose from the dead and people still don't believe this truth. They'd rather make this story about hell being an eternal place of burning. The scripture clearly tells us in Romans 7, Romans 6, I'm sorry, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. Wicked people do not have eternal life. This is why the Bible says death and hell was cast into the lake of fire, and he said this is the second death. That's the death of the soul. That's when you die. That's when the, when the, see, once, once the wicked person dies, you see them in that cast, ain't no coming back to life, being able to speak, hear, and have consciousness, breathe. Don't you know a person can't breathe in fire? We need to stop believing this foolishness that man has made us to think. The Bible says, see, here's what we don't understand. The word fire is to be interpreted spiritually. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Is God an actual fire? No. That burns in a, in a fireplace? No. It's talking about his judgment consumes just like fire does. The Bible also says in Matthew 4, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Are we immersed in fire? No. It's not talking about an actual fire. It's talking about God's judgment. See, when God's judgment is upon the righteous, the righteous is purified through the fire. See, fire does two things. It either purifies or it consumes. 
There's no eternal burning. That's why the Bible said they shall be consumed. But we look at the word eternal, everlasting, and that, that word eternal and everlasting means that their death, their absence from God is everlasting. Their absence from God is eternal. Everlasting fire. That means you're going to be consumed in the fire and you're never going to return to life. That's what that simply means, but we took it out of context. You either purified in the fire or you are consumed. There's only two things fire do. It consumes or it purifies. And the wicked, it will consume them. All over the book of Psalms, it tells us that. That the wicked will be consumed in fire. Not burned for eternal and have a life in fire. Because if they're burning for eternity in fire, that means not only the righteous have eternal life, but they will have eternal life too. But only their eternal life will be in fire. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's our misunderstanding of the words everlasting and eternal. It is death that is eternal. The wages of sin is death, not eternal life and fire. No one, no soul that is wicked will have immortality. Only God and Christ have immortality. He gives us immortality. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. The righteous will have immortality, not the wicked. The wicked will be consumed in fire, but the righteous will be purified. This is, and this story of the rich man and his Lazarus is not about a rich man going to hell and uh, living in hell. If you look up the word hell in your Bible, you will find that it simply means the grave after you die. Once they place you six feet under, you're going into a place called hell, the grave. But we took all these, these key words in this subject, out of context. Hell means the grave. I, I'm not going to do it for us today because I'm, my time is up. But I want you to look up the word hell and you will see it means the grave. The Bible even says Jesus went down into hell. That means he died. Death and hell represents a final eternal place for the wicked who will never return to God, never return to life. People who die don't talk to Abraham. This is a, a story that Jesus is telling to illustrate a spiritual message. People, after you see them in the grave, they never return to life if they're wicked. If they died wicked, and I can't determine who, who dies wickedly and who don't. Only God can judge. After, after the judgment of God, that's when we see uh, it is it's either eternal life or it's death. Y'all remember what Ezekiel said? The soul that sin, it shall die. Your soul is your consciousness. Your soul is your, is your ability to think, breathe, speak. That's, that's, that, that comes from the soul. Your soul is your spirit. And the Bible said the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Don't let us continue to believe the lie that was told by Satan to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You won't surely die. That's what he said, right? And people are believing that same lie today that people are burning in hell for eternal, for eternity with life. It just doesn't make sense. That's not what the Bible is teaching. I have another subject of that uh, on YouTube, BibleTruthMinistries.com. If you want to check it out, I go and I go into a lot about hellfire, what it really means. I use all the scripture. I don't have time to do it in this video. But I pray that you have been blessed. Brother David, good to see you, my brother and sister Don. God bless you. And any of the others who might come in on YouTube and, uh, and hear this message, I pray that you be blessed through what I've shared. And may God continue to keep you strong in faith until next time. God bless you and may God keep you.